Hello and welcome to the Be Glad movement. My name's Pollyanna and I'm on a mission to bring you as many stories as possible of good coming out of bad and reasons to be glad. And today I'm joined with by Dr. Dan. Say hello, Dan. Hi, everyone. Hi, Dan. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to do my usual and get out of the way and just let you dive straight in and tell your story. Okay, cool. So my story is about being an overweight doctor. In fact, I was an officially an obese doctor at the age of 33. Um, So I'm a GP by training and have been uh, qualified since 2009. But I struggled with my weight going back to my teenage years. Um, I never remember being a particularly slim child. I never remember being particularly sporty. Um, I was always kind of last to be picked in sports at school. And my weight problems uh, just really kind of escalated during my 20s, doing a lot of shift work, a lot of night shifts, working in hospitals, just grabbing food as and when, just being exhausted when I finished my shifts and and getting... That's not an uncommon theme, is it? Um, You know, healthcare professionals being poorly themselves because they're on the go all the time. Yeah, sorry. (laughs) No, absolutely. Um, So, yeah, my weight just was going up and up and up. And, you know, I, you know, would every once in a while realise, hmm, there's a bit of a problem going on here. And I, you know, start the, the typical let's eat less and do more movement kind of diet i tried to establish as much of uh you know good exercise habits as i could i started running um i was doing a a 10k run every year and trying to do park run quite often um but you know inevitably six eight maybe ten weeks after starting a diet starting to see some traction on that diet i would fall off the diet and lose you know, I, I'd stopped stepping on the scales and then, you know, a month later I'd realised that I'd gained the weight back again and pretty frustrating, um, pretty embarrassing as a doctor as well because, you know, you've got patients who are coming into you who, you know, expect you to, you know, be a shining example of health yourself and, you know, you know, I, I can only imagine how people feel coming in to see a doctor and trying to ask about their own weight problems and trying to realize and then realizing that the doctor really hasn't got that under control themselves really yeah yeah so let's talk about when things change for me um Ah. so 2016 i went skiing in france and i saw a guy at the so it's like a shared chalet um and i saw at the got a guy at the breakfast table putting butter into his coffee and I'm thinking what are you doing putting butter into your coffee like so as a doctor I'm thinking you're killing yourself like butter's really bad Um, but I had heard about this thing called bulletproof coffee um, which is all about putting butter in in coffee but I'd never really taken that any further so I I just had that conversation with him and I said yeah what you doing mate and so he explained to me and you know, it's really funny how sometimes someone who's got no medical background uh, can really, really help change your opinion on something that, you know, you think you've got um, a good handle on, really. Sure. Um, so, Dan, and he so did. Tell, tell me, what, why is it called Bulletproof Coffee? <laughs> okay, so Bulletproof Coffee, I think that's a trademark. Um, um, there's a guy in the States called Dave Asprey who he's, he's like well known as a biohacker right. and um, he, he's been a big fan of the, the stuff that I'm about to talk about in terms right. of diets and stuff for, for quite a while uh, and he wanted to popularize, popularize Bulletproof Coffee okay. so he's got a series of products that that um that he calls bulletproof coffee um so so yeah this guy was so he so what did this guy explain to me so obviously we come from a me coming from a medical background i'm i'm learning things like calories in there's got a balance with calories out there's energy isn't created or lost it you know that kind of thing so you you need to 
and a problem with weight gain is eating too many calories and not doing enough exercise. Right. And of course that makes on a, on a very basic level, that makes a hell of a lot of sense. And, and talk, thinking about body fat, it's very easy to say, well, I've got too much body fat. Therefore I should cut down on the amount of fat that I'm eating. And uh-huh. you know, it makes a lot of sense on, on a very basic level that, that if you're overweight, you've got too much fat, therefore you should eat less fat. Uh, but unfortunately, as I found out, it doesn't seem to work like that. Mm-hmm. So what this guy taught, taught me was to think, about, uh, to think about it as a hormonal problem, not as an energy balance problem. Okay. And he explained to me the, the key hormone, which is insulin. Okay, so many of pretty much everybody watching this will have heard of insulin it's what diabetics inject themselves with but uh, what does it actually do in the body well it helps glucose from the blood get into the cells right okay so it's that key shuttle to take insulin from from in the bloodstream which is where it basically gets to once we've taken it in to into the cells and it does that with fat cells so Fat cells create create fat from glucose. Okay? okay, so he explained to me that think about what happens when, as a doctor, you put a patient on insulin. The common, the most common side effect is weight gain. Uh-huh. Okay, so hmm, okay, that's interesting. And then think about the situation where a patient hasn't got any insulin production in their body and that's type one diabetes. So the pancreas has failed to produce insulin within the body. Um, Okay. These, these people get really, really sick, uh, often children, they get really, really sick. But one of the key things that happens to them is weight loss. So you've got weight gain from too many calories and you've got weight loss, sorry, weight gain from too much insulin and a weight loss from no insulin when where do calories come into that There's, mm. calories aren't anywhere in that at all really so so yeah he started to introduce me to this idea that it, it's not necessarily about energy balance but about hormone balance okay. and that's the thing with with putting butter into coffee butter you know all you've got in there is fat essentially fat has a very, very small impact on the insulin that our bodies produce. Whereas things like carbohydrates, especially refined carbohydrates like sugar have a massive impact. So it's more about rather than thinking about energy in and energy out, it's more thinking about uh, how you manage your insulin levels within your body. And if you've got a very high insulin levels, you're going to be in a fat storage mode all the time. And if you've got very low insulin levels, then that allows the body to be able to access your stored fat. Okay. So I had a number of conversations over the, the week with this guy about, you know, how, and he'd lost a lot of weight himself and looked really good. Um, so I, as soon as I came back off that holiday, I started a low carb diet where I didn't fear taking in fat. So fat was there to keep me full up. Right. And uh, within the first two weeks, I'd lost about five kilograms. So that's two wow. pounds. So that's ten over 10, 10, 12 pounds. And within six months, I'd gone from being officially obese to being of a normal weight, which is around about thirty kilograms or five stone in weight loss. Wow! So yeah, yeah and that kind of thing has a quite an impact on you. So yeah. I realised that you know, about six, seven, eight weeks in the time, the kind of time where I normally would have fallen off my diet that hang on, something's different here. Something has changed. Something's, you know, I don't feel hungry. I feel really good. And, you know, this is different this time. Um, I'm I'm presuming you didn't just sort of suddenly start like eating butter and, you know, drinking cream and just like really overindulging on fat i think you just sort of wasn't you weren't scared of it anymore it was no like absolutely you allowed to have it without 
Well, actually, I think initially I was pretty scared of um, uh, eating a lot of fat because, you know, for so long we've been told that fat, particularly saturated fat, puts our cholesterol up and it also puts up our, and then that puts up our risk of heart disease in the long term. So, you know, we've, it's a big thing about treating people with statins, medication to lower their cholesterol, you know, and this is pretty big in the medical world, the strong guidelines based around this uh this kind of stuff and so you know i was like how long am i actually going to keep um how much how long am i actually going to keep going with this you know before i realize i'm doing my body a lot of harm so mm -hmm. i started researching it and i started looking back at you know why the why we thought this why do we think that fat is bad for us and as far as i can tell there's not a huge amount of evidence to suggest that there's any real link between cholesterol, heart disease, fat intake. And really that this is something that we've been told by the pharmaceutical companies that helps them to sell statin medication. Right. Um, so, and I started to realize just how much of what we do you know, is, is run by the pharma, you know, is advised by the, we get a lot of advice from pharmaceutical companies about, you know, how to treat type two diabetes and, and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, all of them involve seemingly involve progressively more complicated long-term medications rather than actually preventing this. So, so yeah, I think uh, it started to really open my eyes to the fact that the food and pharmaceutical companies are probably pulling the wool over our eyes a little bit you know i get it they're they're companies they're for-profit companies they have to make profit for their shareholders and but you know we've been you know sold a lie about a lot of stuff because yeah. of the profit of big multinational companies really mm. and so that's where so that's where i'm at is a doctor who's realized that actually a lot of what we're doing is probably harming our patients more rather than than starting to uh, to fix these problems by looking at diet and lifestyle first of all, and we've got a we've got guidelines in place that are fat fearing and carbohydrate um, promoting, um, but that really doesn't necessarily work for a lot of people. Those dietary guidelines started in the nineteen seventies uh, and were initially proposed by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and you have to ask yourself what what have the U S department of agriculture got to gain from putting out dietary guidelines? Well, you know, they were, they were the people that represented all the farmers who were producing all the grain. So of course, so of course, uh, you know, a lot of those guidelines came out because, because they were, they were pushing grain production. Um, and so those guidelines were the first ones to say, you know, you need to reduce the amount of fat you're taking in. And very interestingly, a few years ago, um, there was a British, I think it was a Welsh scientist called Zoe Harkham that looked into why, why we introduced those guidelines. She said, was there ever any, ev any, sorry, was there ever any evidence to introduce the low fat guidelines? And so she looked at studies before the 1970s, before those guidelines were introduced, and found that, no, actually, there wasn't any evidence. Crikey. So then she extended her study to the totality of scientific evidence that we have today. So were there, were there at least some studies after the 1970s that said, yeah, we should introduce some low-fat um, low guidelines? Mm. No, nothing. Nothing... The, the evidence base does not suggest that we should ever have introduced low carbohydrate, uh, sorry, low fat guidelines. Wow. Okay. So I'm really hopeful in the next few years that that's going to hopefully filter through to government and that we should be stopping this fat phobic advice really. Yeah. Uh, watch that space. I'm not so sure it will actually happen, but, um, but it would be hopeful that, that the good work that she's done in those studies will, will hopefully filter through into creating some guidelines for health that's actually based on evidence rather than based on the needs or the desires of 
the US Department of Agriculture. Sure. It sounds to me like someone needs to, governments need to put money into these studies so that they're not swayed by yeah. big corporates, you know. So the thing that, you know, I, I don't want to get into conspiracy theories or anything, but, mm. you know, a lot of our study, scientific studies are funded by the food industry, you know, the big food and drinks manufacturers. There's only really about five of them who own everything. And they have a lot of scientists on their payroll who are doing these studies for them. And, you know, as a scientist who's getting paid to do these studies, you don't bite the hand that feeds you. Right. Yeah, okay. yeah. And the other side of it is the pharmaceutical companies who spend a lot of money running these big clinical trials. But they also happen to be the major taxpayers of our governments. Mm -hmm. okay. So the big corporation taxpayers are food and pharmaceutical industries so at the same time governments find it very difficult to bite the hand that feeds them as well so right. you know and a lot of our a lot of mps you know sit on the boards of the food and pharmaceutical industries so it's a, a very difficult problem to solve really mm. but that's where the internet comes in Hurrah. well the internet's a great disruptor the internet yeah. is a great disruptor. You know, you see what happened in uh, the, you know, where was it? Um, Libya, Colonel Gaddafi. That all came off the back of Twitter, you know, and people starting to organise themselves, and arrange themselves, you know, off the back of Twitter. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so much disruption has come about in this world, probably for good and for bad, off the back of off the internet. That's why I've started a YouTube channel because, you know, it's, it's, it's about just giving people a choice really and telling them that there is a different way of doing things. And I think that that's where things come in with your be glad and, and, and actually, you know, giving some hope to people because I felt hopeless. Mm -hmm. I felt completely out of control and completely powerless to do anything about my weight. Um, and I tried everything and I just saw myself getting bigger and bigger and bigger every year and thinking that it was my willpower or some kind of character defect within me that was was happening and and so many people you know we're putting that blame onto people and saying that you know if you're fat if you're overweight it's because you're a glutton because you've got no willpower, you've got no self-control. And the, the message of hope that I hope to put out there is that that's not true. It's not true. You're being misled by the guidelines. You're being misled by the fact that, you know, there isn't anything you can do about this. And, you know, you've just got to be strong and your willpower is, you know, really where you need to be working on things. And actually there is a way there is a different way to do it and yeah you do need a bit of willpower you need to be a, willing to spend a bit of time cooking healthy food at home but it doesn't need to be overly expensive it doesn't need to be overly difficult and that's that's really what i hope to show people through what i'm doing awesome yeah so you i've watched some of your um youtube videos and they are very informative so i think it's gonna like you say it's about having a choice isn't it we've all mm. been spoon fed this um idea that we shouldn't be eating fat when mm. you've just told us that a lady has done a massive massive project and mm. found that there's no real evidence for that mm. and actually the other, the other point is that we, we're all different you know we've all got our different health needs and our different sort of biochemical makeup I guess um yeah, and so different foods are going to react differently in our bodies um and mm. I, I, personally I'm not very good at eating uncooked greens they don't mm -hmm. agree with me everything has to be cooked till it's limp <laughs> um yeah. you know we're all different so I love that you're putting an uh or, or drawing more attention to this and giving people the facts behind um a, a different way of looking at, at their food intake and it may or may not work for them you know absolutely so. yeah but i think it's about giving people choice and i think that's the that's one of the things that the modern way of doing medicine has really helped me understand this that, you know you should be able to give your your patients an option and a choice and mm. actually you know a low carbohydrate diet is really really effective for type 2 diabetes um, back when i was training as a gp not not five years ago we were told that 
Type 2 diabetes is a progressive, worsening illness that once you've got it, you will just get worse and worse and worse. And really, the, all we could do is control that decline. So I'm just going to busy that phone call. That's all right. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, um, all we could do is control that decline with medication. It's not hard to see where that advice was coming from. Mm -hmm. We now know that there's doctors who are having fantastic results with their patients who are saying, you know, here's another option. You know, you can go on to medication and we can put you on progressively larger doses of medication. But here's another option. You could try this low carb diet. And we could actually end up getting you off your medication and controlling it just with diet alone. And loads of people are doing that. And it annoys a lot of people, <laughs> in, you know, in, uh, in, in, in power. And that people are actually, and, and pharmaceutical companies, you know, don't like this because, you know, if I, if I suggest to someone that they go on a, a, a low carb diet and they do do it, you know, their intake of insulin could could go down by two thirds and insulin is an expensive drug to manufacture and sell uh, mm. and so it's very threatening to people mm. very threatening to the you know the pharmaceutical industry that actually an industry you know a whole a, an illness which is is becoming you know reaching epidemic proportions pandemic proportions yeah. um, it can be treated as simply by by saying mm, you need to cut the carbs out of your diet Right. Rather than loads and loads of medications, which, you know, give people side effects and make people feel even worse and really just manages the decline of their symptoms rather than than actually puts them into remission. Sure. sure. I think I remember seeing uh, it just reminded me of um, a TV show. I think I saw. Correct me if I'm wrong. Is am I right in thinking that sugar is like as addictive as heroin? That on the brain scans they kind of light up the same. I don't know any statistics about that, but it would not surprise me at all. Uh, mm. You know, sugar, sugar isn't really something that is found in in the quantities that we consume. It sugar isn't found naturally in the natural world in those quantities. You know, even with even with fruit think of fruit fruit seasonal really isn't it like fruit yeah. we don't we don't have really sweet fruit all year round um so you'd potentially have that in the kind of summer and autumn time in order to build you up build you up for the winter yeah. uh and you know so it's you know and we, we lump fruit and vegetables together but some fruit is very very high in sugar but take compare that to, you know, the sugar intake in, in, in sugary drinks or in, you know, in blended fruit juice where you've stripped it of all the fiber. Um, you know, it's no wonder that we're starting to have problems because of the amount of sugar that we're taking in. And I'm really thankful that they've started to tax the stuff, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. It's going to be the biggest, uh, the, I think that's going to be a big game changer, actually. Um, uh, starting to tax sugar, uh, I think that's going to really help the long-term trajectory of obesity and di diabetes. Cool. And there's other. I mean, I know you've mentioned your YouTube channel, and I'll share links to that off at the cool. end of the video and below in the description. But mm -hmm. um, you're also writing a book, aren't you? And you're like a, a book about your experiences am i right in thinking that and then there's a recipe lady working on some cool yeah so i work I'm, I'm working with a few different people at the moment i'm working with a um a guy called steve bennett now steve uh steve's not a medical professional he's a businessman and he is uh very very passionate about exactly the same thing as me he he used to run marathons he used to he's trek to the north pole um, yeah. but he has um he was always struggling with his weight and he has decided that his way of going to try and fix the health problems of the country is to start a tv station um and that's called primal cure tv it's on sky channel uh sky channels at the moment it's also live on youtube um primal, primal cure primal tv 
So he's just released a, uh, a this is just a pre uh, pre release copy of a book. It's called Britain is Sick. Um, right. The Primal Cure, Avoid Being a st- Sick Statistic. So Steve's uh, written this. I'm quite, I'm very involved with them. I'm one of their TV doctors. Um, look, I'm on the back. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> and there's, comment, there's comments from me throughout this book. There's uh, pictures of me when I uh, was struggling to lose weight yeah. uh, as well. So yeah, I'm very involved with these guys, which is really, really good. So I'm very proud to be associated with them. Um, I'm also writing my own book at the moment. So what I um, kind of, my brand is called Carb Dodging, which is um, supposed to be quite a lighthearted take on uh, on the joke of salad dodging. So if you've ever heard someone being called a salad dodger uh, for someone who's been overweight, well, this is a bit of a joke on that, really. Uh-huh. Um, so, yeah, I'm hoping to get that book out uh, later next year. Uh, and, yes, there will be a recipe book that goes along with it as well. That's very cool. Um, I personally think maybe this is an opportunity for the future, but I personally think it's very hard when you're out and about to find healthy food on the go. Kind of, the smoothie's got a bit of a, a, a lift, um, you know, have a smoothie. But then, like you say, they're stripped of their fibre and all the sugars are yes. full of sugar, can't they? So oh, absolutely, yeah. Um, very cool. oh, and sorry the other thing I was going to say is sandwiches like that's yeah. the British thing to eat a sandwich you've got Absolutely. the carbs in the, in the bread and they're not particularly good carbs either are they no so I think we lit I, I think you know low carbohydrate diets aren't for everybody they're particularly you know they are very very useful people who are struggling with obesity and type 2 diabetes um, but really you know they're not necessarily for everyone but in terms of what we can get in terms of food when we're out and about on a quick basis, you know, to try and find something that's nutritious and low carbohydrate is really, really difficult. You're looking, you're looking at maybe getting some chicken off uh, in a packet from, from the supermarket or, um, you know, a bag of nuts and things like that. But, you know, it can be really, really difficult to find food. And if you go into, you know, your typical, um, you know, fuel station and try and get something that may be considered vaguely low carb, you're going to really, really struggle. You're going to yeah. really, really struggle. You go into a coffee shop and try and find something that's fairly low carb. You know, you've got a range of sandwiches, cakes, um, and crisps and things like that. It's really, really tricky. Mm. It's possible to eat out low on a low carb diet, but it's certainly not something that is, uh, is easy to do and this is one of my concerns is a lot of the stuff we're sold as it, are healthy options are still very high in sugar and still very high in in carbohydrates uh, and one of the things that i think we got very wrong was fruit juices you know your average your average fruit juice has got pretty much the same amount of sugar in as a can of you know fizzy drink Wow, yeah, you never think of it like that. No, I mean, it's pretty much the same amount of sugar, you know, gram for gram um, in those drinks. And actually, 2016, they took out fruit juice from the national guidance on, uh, on the, you know, the national healthy plate. So fruit juice has gone from that two years ago, uh, yeah, two years ago, and is now got a specific limit on the amount you should consume because you know we thought this is a great healthy option and i'll have a pint of orange juice for breakfast just sugar it's just sugar um it's been stripped of all the fiber and and the same with smoothies you know um you know maybe smoothies aren't quite so innocent Mm. (laughs) brilliant well is there anything else you want to tell us about you know what to expect from you or no, um, so into 2019, I'm really going to be pushing the YouTube channel. So I want to make that a go-to resource for people um, to to go to. I'm going to be organising it nicely into playlists, so you can go through from start to finish. Uh, and hopefully, you know, I'll be putting some position uh, something in place so that you need a, a bit more support from me and my team to be able to get that from me next year because. One thing I, 
that my day-to-day medical practice has taught me is that, you know, it's very easy for me to say, here, this is what you need to do. Uh, you need to have a low carb diet and you know, I can explain that to someone in maybe one, two, three minutes. And some people, some people will go and they will take that information and they will have massive success with it. And that's great. A lot of people need a lot more support through mm-hmm. that process. Uh, and actually we know from studies that longer term behavioral change, you know, people need a lot of support and that's really I hope to be able to sort that out next year. And that's really what my focus is, is to put those, uh, put the initial plans in place for people who want to choose this way of living as a different option um, to go through and have all the information they need. And I'm going to have loads of recipes on the website, things like that. Uh, but also to be able to support people through who, you know, who don't find it as easy and to create a community in order to help people support each other through the difficulties of changing their lifestyle. Yeah. I'm thinking Easter at my mum's house right now. <laughs> that is a difficult situation with all the Easter biscuits and the chocolate and the goodness knows what else. It is. And we've got Christmas coming up as mm. well and Easter. And it seems that a lot of the, you know, a lot of the celebration times, um, you know, the traditional religious, you know, celebration times would have, uh, have now been taken over by, the food companies and are pushing a lot of you know what should you eat at these times mm. okay but we also have to remember that that when we we take it and i don't want to make this about religion it's not about religion but actually yeah. as well as feast days you used to have fast days right yeah okay so it wasn't just all about consuming it was about balance as well and i think we've lost a lot of that balance with um with the modern world sure sure yeah very good point very good point well thank you so much for joining us uh, like thank i said you before for me. oh it's been lovely talking to you i think i could like carry on chatting for ages about it. um but for anyone that does want to know more i will share those links and you videos weekly don't you yeah so, yeah every cool. tuesday awesome thank you dan cool Bye. Well, if you like this video, please do hit the like and subscribe button and you'll get notified when new videos are uploaded. Um, please do get in touch if you've got a video, a, a video, a story that you'd like to share. And it actually doesn't have to be video. You can write your story as well. It all counts because I really do believe that your story in your voice has the ability to help someone in their time of need. And you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter if you search at Be Glad Movement. So I will look forward to seeing you in another episode. Many thanks.